All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 23rd of January, 2008, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, my full name is William N. Van Alstein, Jr., and I was born in Cohoes, New York, on January 22nd, 1923. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. It was yesterday. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I went, graduated from high school, went to Siena College, and when I was in Siena, of course, the war broke out at that particular time, and uh, I went back after the war and the, and the VETS program, and that was my education. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, uh, I was on the, in my mother and father's house in Waterford, New York, and I was with a group of uh, my friends, and uh, we were all talking, and my dad came out and mentioned Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. and, my God, we were very emotional at the time. And Did you know where Pearl it, Harbor was? Not really, no. Yeah, no. most didn't. No. And uh, everybody at that point, you know, immediately the Japanese became an enemy and they all wanted to join and uh, go fight the war. Mm -hmm. Now, did you enlist or were you drafted? The, uh, I enlisted. Uh, I signed up for uh, the, uh, a actually, uh, uh, my father wanted me to finish college in Siena, and I wanted to go fight the war, and uh, so I left, and I had to take a, a job at General Electric Company, and, uh, because I had enlisted in the Navy uh, aviation, and I had to wait and to, you know, take physicals and tests and all that kind of uh, things. And finally, uh, uh, the draft was breathing down my neck, but the uh, the Navy told me, don't worry about it, you're in. And, and I was. Uh, you know, I finally received my orders. And, uh, and then at that particular time, GE didn't want to let me out because I was necessary for the, the defense industry. The defense industry, industry yeah. yes. And I, but they did. I didn't have that uh, a complicated job or anything mm -hmm. like that. And now, why did you decide to enlist? Why did why, I? Why, yes. Because I wanted to make sure that uh, our country uh, was safe from mm -hmm. these people. I certainly didn't want to live under them. Mm -hmm. all, although at that time, uh, I, I was 19 at the time, and, uh, and you know, we were one of those young fellows. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick the Navy? The Navy, I, I, I wanted uh, to fly, and I probably should uh, say this, when I was in Siena, apparently they could see the war coming, I mean the government could. Mm -hmm. And so they went to the colleges and offered free flying courses. And I saw a sign up on the bulletin board one day at Siena, and it said that come on out and we'll teach you how to fly at Albany Airport. And so I signed up and went out and, and there was a, only a few of us and uh, actually received my private pilot's license at that particular time. What, what kind of airplane did you learn to fly on? Well, that was a, a Cub, the old Yellow Peril as they called them, a, a single engine and, mm -hmm. and then uh, I was learning, this, and then I, of course, had already enlisted. But uh, how long were you in this program? But I, I saw the the pictures of the Corsair, which mm -hmm. I don't know whether you people yeah. know of, of the Gull Wing, oh, and yeah. I wanted to fly that. <laughs> <laughs> I never did. But <laughs> how, how long were you in this flying program before you went into service? Probably about four months. I can't re remember exactly, but. But my mother didn't want me to fly, and uh, she thought it was too dangerous. But she finally gave in. Now, did that? Do you feel that that gave you an edge once you went to 
flight school because you were already a licensed pilot? Did, did that make things easier for you? I thought it would, but actually it didn't at all because I was with a lot of fellows that had never flown before and uh, the training, in, uh, I felt, in the Navy was excellent. Mm -hmm. Now, where did you go for your training? The, well, th it's a funny story. Uh, uh, I received my orders to report down to 120 Broadway in New York City. Now, when was this? What year? This was in 43. Okay. And No, 42. It was mm -hmm. 42. And uh, I went down and, you know, they had a party for me, goodbye and all this. And uh, I got the orders and where did they send me? The RPI in Troy. <laughs> and I went up there on a V-5 program. And uh, when I got to RPI and uh, there was a whole train load going up and uh, my name is Von Alstein and they went alphabetically and they ran out of rooms. So I didn't have a room, so I had left the night before, and the next day I was back home again. I walked through the door and said, hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to wait about a month. Then I received new orders, and again went to 120 Broadway, received my orders, and this time there was no party. <laughs> and uh, where did they send me? Union College. <laughs> I went to Schenectady, New York. I stayed there. Again, it was the V-5 program. And uh, there they flew the Yellow Peril again out of, at the Schenectady County Airport. Uh, we lived at Union College and, uh, and of course we did all our physical and, and, and studying and, and flying at that mm -hmm. particular time. And that was probably around four or five months that uh, we were there, and and then. Uh, were you able to get home much, or at no, all? No. No. Uh, well, you would think that you mm -hmm. could, but boy, they kept us busy. I'll tell you, and you, you were flying a lot and had a lot of studying and 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 exercises, of course, physical mm -hmm. exercises. So, I got home, I think, t uh, maybe twice in those four or five months took some of my friends with me to get a good meal and mm -hmm. that type of thing. And, and then I was home for maybe a week. Uh, then I received my orders and they sent me to uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, University of North Carolina. And uh, there I was to do uh, a lot of physical training. They have uh, all the coaches in the United States were down there and as a matter of fact uh, the one battalion ahead of me was uh, Ted Williams, uh, Gabby Hartnett was a uh, baseball player and, he, and uh, he was a coach down there and uh, Johnny Pesky was with Williams and they were playing baseball on the uh, Chapel Hill team at the time. And I got to know Ted a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. When I say no, I'm not as a personal friend or anything, but we would sit at times, a whole group, and be talking and so on. He, he was a great individual. And they kept him there for uh, baseball, he and Pesky, and, and I, went, I graduated out of there. Uh, there was no flying whatsoever there, but it was but very, at, very strenuous. Going? Uh, I was there again about four months. And mm -hmm. There we played uh, football in 100 degree weather and full gear. And we played every sport imaginable, swimming and track and uh, of course the old drills with the Marine Corps uh, uh, gunny sergeants. <laughs> Very interesting. So this was mainly and, for physical? Uh, and study, and, and study, and study about the planes mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. The uh, I was picked when I got there uh, to lead a company and as a as a uh, company officer. And at that particular time, I said I, I don't have any training and, uh, I'm with people, but they said, well, you do now. <laughs> And my main job was to take attendance in the morning, make sure everybody was there, report on time, march them to class, or 
to one of the uh, exercises, the physical exercises, and make sure they get back to the mess, and then again back at night, you know, that type of thing. And I can tell a little funny story there. I was marching them along, and they weren't in step, and uh, there was there was uh, two platoons of them. And uh, I didn't see some admiral going by in a car, and uh, he didn't like the way they were marching or talking in ranks. And next thing I knew, I was called in, and and uh, so they they told me, you know, what had happened, and that, that I had to do something about it. And I so they said the one thing we were going to do when when as soon as the leave comes up, we were given one leave all the time I was at Chapel Hill, that's all. And that was two days that they allowed us to go into Raleigh, North Carolina, and they said, you're not going to go. Hmm. Well, I learned a lesson then that uh, if they give you a job, uh, you better do it, and uh, you just can't let personal feelings come in. So I learned a lot. A lot. And, uh, I, I marched all weekend long with a Marine, and I only had time out to go to the John and, uh, and to a half an hour to eat, and I marched from sun up to sundown with a, with a rifle and the heat. So when these guys came back, uh, that particular Monday morning, I had a little meeting and then said, don't get out of line, <laughs> because I'm not going through this again. So. It, it's amazing what uh, what your how your life changes. Mm -hmm. I think this is all I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. And I left there, and as I said, uh, Williams and Pesky stayed there, and they sent me to Peru, Indiana. And I, when I got to Peru, Indiana, I, I flew Stearmans. These were the open cockpit, mm -hmm. by wing planes. And again, no matter where you went in the Navy. Uh, you did calisthenics and, and a lot of physical training all, all the time, plus studying, and uh, we flew a lot. We flew at night and everything, and it was amazing uh, in those days and with the way you see it today, you know, with all the lights. We had smudge pots out on a dirt field, that's all they were, at night to be able to land, and, and uh, we did acrobatics. and all kinds of things and learning to, to fly. Again, I'm, you were kept going up in horsepower is what mm -hmm. they were doing mm -hmm. to you. And then when I, I finished there, uh, as a matter of fact, Williams and Pesky came out there after me and before I graduated, they were there. And Pesky washed out there. Oh, really? He didn't make it as a flyer. Williams, Williams did. Mm -hmm. And they sent me there from there to uh, Pensacola, Florida. And I went down there and they put me in a uh, Volte uh, V airplane, which again was a higher horsepower. And again, we did a lot of, uh, of formation flying, night flying, bombing, and uh, again, uh, fighter tactics and so on. And then they sent to, to you to another field, which was strictly instruments. You were flying instruments all the time, learning that. And uh, then you went to uh, your senior, which was Corey Field. Uh, and there they, they flew SNJs, uh, which was the Army version of the Texan. And uh, we did a lot of bombing, machine gunning, formation flying, night flying, and over the water, and navigational hops, things of that type. And if you graduated, of course you had all these check rides all the time. Somebody would give you a check ride and, and, and mark you as to whether you had successfully passed or you were allowed three downs, what they call failures, and then you were sent to <coughs> into the Navy as a sailor. Now, did many wash out while oh, in your programs? A lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. All the way along, mm -hmm. they had to wash Were there out. many accidents? There were, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, the 
runways weren't there. They had what they call mats, and you, know, you all took off together, that type of thing. And, and uh, there was a lot of ground looping and things of that type. And it was enough, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was uh, mid-air collisions and formation flying and things of that type. Then we also learned how to jump, you know, out of the plane with a parachute and things of that type. And we had physicals all the time, particularly your eyesight. They check constantly on that, and, and your peripheral vision, things of that type. Uh, it was it was an excellent training, uh, and they were always uh, telling you to be an officer and a gentleman in the in the navy and. I think we learned that. So after we graduated from uh, there at Pensacola, we received our our wings, the Navy Gold Wings. And uh, at that point, say about three weeks before you graduated, the they asked you had to uh, get measured for uniforms. And at that time, you had to make up your mind whether you wanted to be a Navy pilot or a Marine pilot. You could be either. Mm -hmm. Some of it, uh, again, was what they needed. They needed, at that point, desperately pilots out in the Pacific because the Japs were running wild on them, and, and, uh, and they didn't have them. So they were trying to get... Uh, fighter pilots at that time, and of course bomber pilots, SPDs, and, and the Avengers. And uh, so I decided to stay in the Navy. So my roommate, we were all the same, we were all Navy, and two weeks later he's standing there in a Marine uniform, and then he was sent to a Marine air base, and I stayed there, uh, went to a Navy air base with the Call operational training in there. They put you into, I got into the Avengers and did a lot of training there, just sitting in the airplane learning to, where all the instruments were and they blindfold you and you tell you to point to the altimeter and touch it or whatever on the instrument panel and you had to pass all those things. And, and were you happy that you were? Put in the Avengers. I know you wanted to be in the Corsairs. But. Well, everybody wanted to be a fighter pilot, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one of those uh, jocks. But uh, no, I was happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the other thing is, and then uh, I had two crewmen. They I was assigned to two crewmen in the Avenger, and one was a turret gunner, and the other uh, he was a radioman, and a what they call a stinger. He had a stinger out of the tail underneath him. The bomber was a 30 caliber, and they had 50 up in, in the turret, and then I had two two 50s in the wings uh, up on the front. But uh, and we became very close. In fact, we stayed together right till the end of the of the war. And 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 today, our, our well, one just died about a year ago. My my turret gunner. He lived out in Kansas, uh, a fellow by the name of Woody, and the Alexander, the radioman, he's still alive. He's out in Ohio, and we, I call them every Christmas, and I know their families, and, but we were all the same age, you know. I mean, here I was, uh, the captain of the plane, I was like 20, and and they were the same, same age, and, uh, and they were excellent. Excellent people. Yeah. Now, what were their ranks? Well, they were like radiomen, uh, mm -hmm, first mm -hmm. class, that type of thing, mm -hmm. or gunner, mm -hmm. uh, first class. That, uh, and uh, they went, a lot of them washed out, too. They got air sick, uh, you know, depending on the pilot flew and everything, and, and whether they enjoyed that or not. Some of them went just through basic training as a uh, as a sailor and uh, to be on a ship and then decided to well I'd like to be a crewman mm -hmm. and then they sent him to school to be able to do that but uh, and that was uh, operational 
we, the, I had an individual that just came back from Guadalcanal at that time, and uh, he was lucky to be alive, and he, he was the one that was training us and, and what to do, gave us a lot of tips because He'd already been in the fray with the, with the Japs and with the things that they did, and mm -hmm. beware of this and that and so on. He, he was very helpful. And, and uh, so at, at that particular point, then I was assigned uh, a squadron, which was the VC-92, which is a composite squadron of fighters and bombers. And uh, I was sent to uh, California to uh, join the squadron and uh, arrived in San Diego. Uh, and uh, I found out that my squadron was out in the, in the desert practicing night, a lot of night flying and bombing. So I had to go out there. I was out at Salt Sea. And boy, you talk about hell on earth. That was it right out there. Uh, hot, you know, it was like 140 degrees in the daytime. Uh, and uh, it was dry heat. And they didn't fly actually during the day. They, they flew at night because it was cooler. And uh, I can remember the, just getting there and they had a, dug a hole out of the sand and put a tarp in it and filled it with water and that was a swimming pool <laughs> and, and that was about a hundred degrees the water <laughs> you didn't even go in it <laughs> and fortunately they had air, some air conditioning in the uh, the Quonset huts and the, the skipper told me to you know welcome aboard all things like that and he said go down tomorrow morning and get in the plane and familiarize yourself with the area and he said Make sure you take about 10 <laughs> canteens of water in case you get down because you're going to need it. Mm -hmm. And I went down and you couldn't even put your hand on the wing. It was so hot. You could fry an egg on the, on the, the wing of the plane. And I was a little worried about uh, temperature, engine temperature and oil temperature. But off I went and looked around, picked out some rocks and things of that type. and in case I went down so I knew where I was and came back and then started flying nights and and uh, we, we did that for oh I'd say about four weeks uh, that I was out there and then we went back to uh, Los uh, Alamitas and flew out of there and we were constantly going out and bombing different islands off the Pacific coast to, uh, with, you know, water bombs, mm -hmm. things of that type, and, and we were working uh, with the um, different ships in the area. Uh, they would run a destroyer <laughs> along the coast and we'd drop torpedoes and, and the torpedoes were terrible. The United States had the worst torpedoes in the world at that time. And uh, the Japs had excellent ones. Mm -hmm. They ran true. Ours would porpoise go up, run around the circle, and things of that type, and they'd shoot them in. <coughs> it was, supposedly we were testing them as they came off the manufacturer, and we weren't too happy to see the results of these mm -hmm. things. And a lot of it had to do with the different tales that they didn't, uh, they hadn't perfected. And constantly throughout the war, it, before the end of the war, just before the end of the war, to, for us to drop a torpedo, and uh, we had to come in and almost be like at maybe 90 knots with your flaps down and, uh, uh, and prop just about anywhere from 50 to 75 feet above the water. And of course, it was very dangerous uh, when we came in, and uh, you had to coordinate with the fighters and the dive bombers. Uh, uh, they all they wanted the torpedo planes to come in on the front of the battleships or cruisers or other carriers, maybe 
five from each side, so no matter which way they turned, you, you know, they were going to get the torpedoes. Well, they would take uh, normally maybe, you'd be around 10,000 feet when you'd start off. And the fighters, had, uh, the, the TBs would start down, forming and getting ready for their first. And then the fighters had, had come down because they could go a lot faster. And they were supposed to pass you on the way down and then start strafing in front of you so that any of the anti-aircraft fire and so on, these guys would be ducking. Well, that didn't work out too well. <laughs> and then, of course, the dive bombers were coming right down behind them. But uh, it, it, it was something else. But the, at the end of the war, we could drop them at uh, 1,200 feet. And they had perfected it so they wouldn't pur mm -hmm. porpoise or run around in circles, things of that type. And, uh, now, how, how many, what kind of different planes were there in your squadron? Well, uh, those were the uh, three. I mean, they, they had fighters. Okay. Are you, you talking were, about the actual model? Yeah, well, you said you had Wildcats with well, fighters. Yes. Mm -hmm. But see, the, the Wildcat was built, uh, which was the F 4F, was built by Grumman. The, mm -hmm. the F signature was Grumman's designation. Uh, F6F was mm -hmm. built by Grumman, you know, the TBF, mm -hmm. Torpedo Bomber Grumman. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they needed uh, fighters. Um, the F4 couldn't stay with the Zero at all. And uh, they, if they, they could turn inside the Zero, but that was about it. The, the, the Zero could outrun them and climb them. Mm -hmm. And our pilots were superior, fortunately, and I mean that very mm -hmm. sincerely. Uh, and so we were able, because of that, to sort of stay with them. But they needed a fighter bay in the Navy, and they were trying to get the F-6 off the Grumman line. Well, that meant that the torpedo bombers weren't coming off. Originally, they had the... Um, Devastator was the torpedo bomber. Mm -hmm. And some gay, they were all shot down. They never, every time they made a torpedo run, they shot them all down. And uh, they were slow, they were terrible. And uh, so the, uh, the Avenger came along. And, uh, but they had to stop making them to put everything in production on the F-6. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was at that particular time, and I think it's it's just wonderful of, again, what the, uh, the Americans can do. Uh, they took all the Detroit car manufacturers who were doing nothing and that never made an airplane in their life and told them, go ahead and make the Avenger, and which they did. They went down to Bethpage, Long Island, to Grumman, and learned, of course, but then went back and put it into practice, cleaned out their plants, put in all new production lines, and they made what they call the TBM, the M being the designation for General Motors. And uh, they built a beautiful ship. They had a lot of uh, things in it that were in hydraulics and things of that side that were better than the, than the Grumman plane. Basically, it was the same, but, uh, and then, uh, then the, they, uh, and that's what they did when they made the FM, too, uh, which came out after the F-4. And then, of course, the F-6 took over and the F-4U, the, uh, the Corsair. Corsair had had a terrible time trying to land on a carrier. They had a lot of accidents. And, uh, and landing on a carrier, I think you, you all know, is, it's a very delicate operation and, uh, and, and a lot of dependence at that time on what they call an LSO, a landing signal officer. And he was the one that had flags, one in each hand, and he would give you signs as to whether you were too high, too low, or turn this way, turn that way, cut your speed, and so on. Now could you describe the steps? How did you learn how to land on a carrier? We did uh, a landing set, uh, operational training uh, on, on the uh, runways. And uh, what they do, they'd mark off uh, lane marking. 
the deck of a carrier where you were supposed to land. Land, and we would fly around and come around and at that altitude and come in and land and then take off again and do that day after day after day. And uh, the only thing about it was, of course, <coughs> the carrier wasn't moving. Mm -hmm. And when the first time when you got out there and you did the pattern, you know, there's nothing to it, and you come down and you start, you're supposed to make your turns just before you get to the end of the carrier, see, start mm -hmm. around. And, well, the carrier was way up there <laughs> by the time you came around and uh, you had to give it the gun, so then you had to change your, but you learn mm -hmm. by experience and uh, there's, it's just a, a, a great excitement, boy, when you catch that wire, I'll tell you. Yeah. Now, when you learned, um, you ended up on the, on the smaller escort carrier. Did you start learning on the larger carriers and then the escort? Yes, or? yes I learned on the Saratoga, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and on the Lexington. And, uh, and both of those out, off of, uh, of uh, Dago and Los Alamitas would, you know, why they were there I have no idea, but uh, all of a sudden they'd say, today we're going to go out and do some carrier landings and mm -hmm. that type of thing, and a lot of them crashed. They had barriers, what they call a barrier. Today they don't have it because they have the angle deck, mm -hmm. and, and they, these guys were excellent in putting this barrier up and down. They, they kept it down because you could run right over it. And because uh, all the planes, they had to spot, once you would land, they had to spot the plane on the forward part of the deck. Well, now the only thing that protected the pilot that just landed and his crew and the planes and whoever was working up there on the deck was this barrier. Mm -hmm. And so when they came through, and a lot of them sometimes would hit and bounce and go right over the barrier. And, of course, they didn't have the power crash on the planes, and a lot of people were killed that way, and, uh, uh, which we had several of those, and, uh, or they would go into the barrier, and that would screw up the engine, and a lot of them hit the island, they'd come down, and maybe they'd blow out. Now, keeping in mind again that that LSO, he has to keep a certain balance of the ship going up and down, so if you're coming in, and that ship is coming up, and you're coming down, boy, you're going to wham, and a lot of the landing gears would just go right out flat, and then they'd skid all over the place. And uh, I had, uh, originally, my uh, division leader, he broke both his ankles the uh, uh, first time he landed on a carrier, and that was the end. He was out. I never saw him again. He just came down so hard as the... Uh, the carrier was coming up. Mm -hmm. So, and then we did a lot of night flying because we, when we got to Pearl Harbor, uh, the squadron, they also trained us in anti-submarine warfare. And uh, I can remember listening to records for hours and, you know, what's that? A wrench drop. Uh, what was that? A fish noise, you know, trying to listen. They had what they call radio sauna boys that you would drop once you, if you saw a submarine, you picked it up and of course it would dive, then you would drop these sauna boys around and they were all listening devices, you'd drive around the circumference and they were all color coded so you knew just where you were and you'd listen for noise and trying to find which way the submarine was going. Mm -hmm. And we had a Torpex torpedo at that time, that was a secret torpedo, ran on on sound, cavitation actually, as the propeller of the submarine turns, it makes a bubble in the back, and when that bubble breaks, there's a sound that comes out of it. Well, this was tuned into that, and it would just follow that and go and blow the submarine up. And that type of a thing, we call them hot dogs at that time. And, uh, You've probably been through all this. I hope I'm not. No, no. this is all new. Uh, it is. We haven't done many carrier no. pilots. And, uh, and how, how long did the process take? I, I probably depended on the individual, but how long did it take you from, 
you know, learning on land to le land on this simulated deck to landing on an actual deck. Well, about. I'd say probably three months mm -hmm. to do that. I'm even trying to think when they had the B-25s. I think they took three or four months training on the simulation of the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be, and of course, they never did they land in the carrier. They took yeah, off. Yeah, they took off. And, that, but, uh, and the carrier is, uh, uh, again, one of the big things in, in Navy flying is we always used to kid the Army about you know, they never got lost because they could follow the railroad tracks, you know, that type of thing, or a road. Well, we didn't have anything out there mm -hmm. but uh, waves. And I'll tell you, you can get lost easy at sea. And we had to do our own navigation. And uh, the only thing that they would give you uh, before you left in the ready room was they'd give you the wind at that particular time. And then they would also give you their speed as to what they were doing and the approximate course. They wouldn't uh, definitely stay on that course if, if uh, the enemy came along or whatever. They would have to zigzag. And so you had to take that then plot where you were going. Well, sometimes we did what they call a close support, too, on the islands. Uh, we helped on, on the Philippines and the Lingayan Gulf. I, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. But is that all right? Yes, yes. yes. And uh, it, when we went into uh, Lingayan Gulf, I mean, we didn't know the island before, the Philippines, and uh, so you would be maybe 100 miles off the coast or something like that. Well, then you'd be in there bombing and, and you would be on, 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 uh, on it's a lot of the different targets. And you'd be on station, what they call station. And when these, the Marines or the Army, depending on who you were supporting, that had landed on the invasion, then all of a sudden they would call. Well, in, within our our uh, our station, we may have 500-pound bombs. We may have 100 pounds. We may have, we may have what they call daisy cutters, with depth charges with a big fuse on it. Would blow above the the land. We'd have napalm that we were dropping, and they would, depending upon what they were running into, then they would call, and that's where we'd use these charts, and they would try to lay out sometimes a colored ribbon like so that that hey buddy we're behind that don't <laughs> drop anything <laughs> over here we you drop them over there you know <laughs> and then we would go down close support like that and uh, you know 50 feet above the ground and drop the bombs mm -hmm. now your first actions were in the Philippines as close air support yes mm -hmm. yes we went to a place called Ulithi, which was a fleet anchorage, and they had moved all the natives out of the, the islands, a group of islands, and uh, everything was in there. And uh, I can remember when we first went to the Philippines, I stood there in the carrier deck and, and watched. They all went out single file, the battleships, the cruisers, the carriers, the destroyers, the, Troop ships, everything, you know, and it was awesome. And you thought, my God, we, we don't have to worry about anything. Well, we pulled out into the China Sea, and boy, they hit us. They sunk the carrier right next to us. And uh, of course, the carriers, they never stopped to pick up anybody or anything. And, and uh, at the, the only people that fly at that time were the fighters. They don't send bombers up because. They're useless, mm -hmm. but uh, this was the first that I had ever seen a kamikaze, and I just could not believe it, you know, that this individual would commit suicide to try and sink us. Mm -hmm. But we now, uh, the Tulagi, were you the first cr crew on it? This was, it must have been a new No, the originally the Tulagi, uh, was in the, believe it or not, was in the, uh, it's the, was the only carrier, uh, I hope I'm correct in saying this, uh, 
that flew swastikas and the uh, Japanese emblems on the on the bridge that they had shot down. It was in the invasion of southern France. Oh, okay. And they had Navy pilots that flew F-6s off of it. And it was over there and also in uh, uh, Africa. And when it came back after that uh, invasion, uh, that's when we got on it. So there had been a squadron on okay. it before. Now, being a, a escort carrier, it had only one squadron on, on it? Yes. How many men in a squadron? That's why they call it composite. Mm -hmm. A hundred. Approximately. How many men? hundred. hundred, okay. And you, um, how many aircraft did you have? Well, we had uh, 20 uh, torpedo bombers and, and uh, we had about 28 fighters. Okay. The other, the bigger carriers, they had a squadron of fighters, a squadron of Avengers, and a squadron of dive bombers. Mm -hmm. Normally there was like three squadrons on the big ones. Mm -hmm. And they carried close to 100 planes. Okay. But landing on a big carrier, after landing on the small ones, you know, nothing. <laughs> you know, it was mm -hmm. like landing on a super, or driving on a super highway with four or five lanes. Uh, uh, ours was, the big carriers were approximately 1,200 feet long, 1,000 to 1,200 feet long. And, and uh, the landing area, we'll say, was half of that. Well, ours, ours was only 500 feet long, and the landing area was half of that. So we had like, let's say, 200 to 250 feet or so to, to get in there. And, uh, and the other thing is, my plane, my wingspan was 54, almost 55 feet, and the width of the carrier was only 70. So just to get by the island and everything is... Uh, you had to be very careful. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not trying to make a big thing no, out of no, that no. at all. But they they trained you so well, believe me. I mean, and, and even you know, like coming in at night, we did a night bombing out there. Uh, uh, the uh, Japanese suicide planes were coming off of Formosa. And we'd go over and bomb the runways at night. Well, then when you come back, you had to land. And we were probably one of the few carriers out there that did a lot of night flying. And, and mainly we were, we did so much night flying, which uh, right at the beginning of this interview I was telling you like we were out in the desert doing a lot of night. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently at that time they had us slighted for this anti-submarine warfare. Well, we flew all night. And our job was to the, the submarines at that time, they had to surface to recharge the batteries. They had to have air to recharge the battery. And uh, so we would fly trying to keep them down. Mm -hmm. or, and if they came up, we were naturally trying to sink them. So we had to do a lot of night flying and, and a lot of night landings. And, you know, one guy may fly three hours. You know, then another one mm -hmm. would go off for three hours and so on uh, through the night. It wasn't one that was up there all night long or anything. Mm -hmm. But you had to do everything. I mean, as the pilot, you didn't have a co-pilot. The crewman could not get to you at all in the TBF. They could crawl up there, maybe put a hand through a hole and hand you something, but other than that, you... You never saw them while you were flying. They were all in the back. Was your ever plane your plane ever seriously damaged at all? Or? I was hit by shrapnel and, mm -hmm. and uh, machine gun fire. You know that type of thing. And hydraulics. My hydraulics were shot out. My uh, oil leaks. Uh, I had trouble one time coming back. With the oil was all over the windshield and trying to get on and. They don't like to break radio silence, but they did to get me down. And uh, because I just couldn't see you. You're trying to look out, and what I was doing was, as I went out, I was pushing right rudder and skidding the plane. Because, uh, but he did a 
great job. You talk to me right now. So they, they're they they're great. They're mm -hmm. just great people out there. Today they use an entirely different system. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, we always had to land what they call a three-point, which was very difficult coming into the carrier. What, what do you mean by that? Well, is when the plane sat on the ground, the tail wheel was at an angle to the front two wheels. Mm -hmm. Today they're all tricycle. Right. And so it's a lot easier to see. Mm -hmm. When we came in, our nose was a, you had to slow down. We came in about 85 knots, around 90 miles an hour. And so your nose had to be up in the air. So you had to look. And that was one of the things with the Corsair. It had such a big nose, a long nose. They couldn't see the deck. What was the stall speed? Pardon? What was the stall speed? We would stall, well, I, I'm going to say 85, depending upon the plane. But, you know, each one was a little bit different. You got used to them. But say 80, 80 knots anyway, uh, you, you'd had it. Yeah, so you, you had We a, were right above that. stall, yeah. yeah. We had full flaps and uh, coming in, and you had to be very, very careful. Of, uh, but again, the LSO, I went to LSO school after I came back from the Pacific, and I was, they were training me to, to, there you have to start flying all the different planes and listen to engines. Mm -hmm. These guys could, all, could tell by the attitude of the plane coming in whether you were approaching even the stall speed. It's amazing what they can see mm -hmm. by the tail hook hanging down, by the, the position of the wheels, position of the flaps to the horizon, you know, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's something else. And they, and they were great people. But we had, uh, we did EWO, EWO was terrible. I mean, with the loss of men, I shot rockets in the EWO that we, we ran right out of. We had uh, four rockets under each wing, which was equivalent to a five-inch howitzer shell. And we could fire those singly or all at once, where we could fire the two outboard and then keep coming in, whatever. And, uh, of course, these guys were all in caves. Everybody was pinned down on the beach. and. Uh, Sirbachi was just, the whole island just smoke. And we would just, we would come in and fire and drop bombs, go back, load up, come back, go load up, back and forth. How many sorties did you fly in a day, do you, do you think? Well, at, like at Iwo, we probably had three or four. That, uh, and we weren't doing anything. You know, I mean, really. Because they, they were all inside that mountain. For each sortie, uh, when when you came back and landed, how long did it take to uh, load up again? Did we, you refuel also? Oh or? yes, oh yeah, they did the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You probably had, uh, I'd say, an hour and a half to two that you would be on the deck that, oh. that they would be doing this, and you could get something to eat and, mm -hmm. and whatever. Because you, know, you, know, you know there was a bunch of carriers now up there. It wasn't mm -hmm. just us. Yeah, we we had uh, in in our task force there was six jeeps, and then maybe seventy five miles away there was another six jeeps. You know, I mean that type of thing. Another task force. It'd all be the same, but it'd be like task force one four six two, one four six three, mm -hmm. one four that type of thing. Now you had some photographs of Iwo Jima. Could you show those and talk about what you did there? Well, I guess so. <laughs> the uh, a couple photographs that were Iwo Jima was. Is this the? No, I can't you know. Been so long ago, it's open now. No, there was that one of you, you yeah, said, you were bombing. That village, was it? Yes. There it is. Yeah, but I think this was. It, 
April 7th. No, it could be. Evil, man. Well, this would have been a village, uh, we'll say there, and of course uh, they heard that this village contained gasoline and a lot of ammo, things of that type, and, uh, and we just said, well, you know, are we bombing women and children? Mm -hmm. And, and even today, if war and what they say is terrible, but believe it or not, the American still uh, treasures the lives of individuals. Mm -hmm. They just don't come out, go out and bomb just to kill. I mean, you know, that yeah. type of a thing, innocent people is what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. But, uh, okay. They certainly try to protect themselves against troops and so mm -hmm. on. But, mm -hmm. Uh, but when we went down and dropped the bombs, they assured us that there wasn't anything there. It was just loaded with them, and it certainly was. That thing blew up, and you couldn't even see a tree afterwards. There was so much gasoline and uh, ammunition in all those grass huts mm -hmm. that you see there. But uh, the uh, we we did a lot of uh, you know ships. Going after them, that uh, we we didn't do the the actual the big battleships or anything. That was done with the big carriers. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of smaller ships that uh, destroyers and things that uh, uh, maybe run in two or three pairs or something, and we'd find out we'd go after them. And I know I was sent out a couple of times. Uh, we we pro could go oh maybe a th over a thousand miles you know and the and the, the gas and the range and the, we were sent out all by ourselves that's when you knew you were, you were expendable <laughs> look we were looking for the Jap fleet mm -hmm. and of the, the, course the big question was well what do you do when you find it <laughs> and say goodbye or what. Mm -hmm. And I remember going along, and of course we had radar in our TV, t TVMs, and, and uh, I remember Ace, my my radio man, said, got a couple of blips. He said, whoa, he said, I got more than a couple. And I thought, whoa, we got the Jap <laughs> fleet, you know. <laughs> and uh, with, we could tell by the size of the blip, the size of the ship. And uh, he said it's a whole task force, as far as he was concerned, out there. And uh, so I said, well, we let's put, get the coordinates down and we'll wire it back. I had no sooner said that to him on the radio, and my gunner said, you know, there's uh, some planes approaching at 2 o'clock, whatever it was. And I went, whoa. And I looked up, and I could see, and I went, thank God. And they were all F-6s. And what we had run across was uh, Halsey's task force, and uh, they were all U.S. ships. And these were F-6s, and he, they just came over and waved to me and went on their way. And <laughs> <laughs> well, how was Okinawa different than Iwo Jima? You had Okinawa to face was, was in, uh, uh, I can remember Okinawa was Easter Sunday morning when they invaded it. And uh, I was on my way in when all the landing barges were going in. You could you could see them and I was just praying for them. We had been up there like two weeks previous. We'd always be there bombing the islands mm -hmm. and trying to uh, get rid of some of the targets to make it easier for them. And, the old battle wagons were would be with us, like the New York and the Texas and so on. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the real old ones, and they'd just sit out there and they'd fire these shells in all day long, you know. And they it was a piece of cake walking in Okinawa for the Marines and the Army, and uh, I remember going down on, on Naha. And uh, I think I, I would shot up a couple of trucks, and that's all that was there. There was nothing else there. And they had all gone down to the end of the island. The Marines went north, as I recall, and didn't run into any opposition. The Army went south, and they were looking, and all of a sudden they hit the 
where they were all down the end of the island. They had to call on the Marines back and go down. And they had a hell of a fight then uh, from then on. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as the initial invasion of Rero, they, they just barely got on the beach. Those guys, you feel so sorry for them, you know. I mean, I, I would go home every night and had a clean bed and a meal. These guys, you know, what did they have? It's terrible. Of, uh, what the uh, the soldier went through. They they went through a lot more horrendous things than the I would say the pilots ever did in, in the navy. Mm -hmm. uh, other than the kamikazes after us, or you are in a dog fight or something like that. We were not too bad, when, except when we were maybe coming down and they were shooting at us. And the ones that went after the ships was tough. But uh, were you, thank God for those dog faces, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Were you afraid a little more in Okinawa with the kamikazes, the number of kamikazes? We were, all, we were all afraid of the kamikazes. Mm -hmm. uh, I stood one day, believe it or not, I had just come back <coughs> from a sortie and landed and <coughs> one of my roommates uh, was a fighter pilot. He, hey Dutch, they used to call me the Dutchman. He said, hey Dutch, and we were just talking. It was actually noontime, beautiful sunny day. And we were looking up, and a plane was flying over. And we were just talking, watching the plane. All of a sudden, the plane started going like that. And I said to him, to my little guy, I said, "What the hell's he doing? He's coming down." And then all of a sudden, we kept looking, and there was a jap. And he came down. Just by the grace of God, he picked the carrier next to us. And we went bang, right. And the message that came from the captain of the carrier was an unidentified aircraft just passed through my flight deck. Hmm. That thing blew up. Because, you know, I mean, it's stuff like that. You know. What carrier was it? Do you remember? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I can't think of the name. I know. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name. But it went terrible. Was it a, a, a escort? Jeep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was a jeep. And uh, why, you know, you can see it today in Iraq, these guys blowing themselves up and everything, but uh, mm -hmm. no. No, no, no. no. Uh, what did you do after Okinawa? After Okinawa, let's see, you uh, Were you there for the typhoon? Yes, we were in that. Mm -hmm. in the typhoon and uh, as a matter of fact uh, I thought I was going to get court martial. Maybe I shouldn't even tell it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and many times the it seems like the ship's officers uh, they had a grudge just not all of them now just some of them um, against the pilots. They always thought the pilots Everybody treated them like God or something, you know. That wasn't mm -hmm. true at all, but uh, and they made it tough for you. Well, we had to stand watch uh, every night, a, a, one person. It was my turn on the watch, and what we had to do was go down and check the the cables, the three quarter inch cable, holding those planes down on the deck. Make, had a little flashlight and you go around and check and make sure everything was all right and go back and report and, and then go down maybe an hour later and that type of thing. Well, the seas are rougher as you can be and I, I went out on the bridge and reported to the OD and he, he said, uh, you better go down and check the flight deck and I said, okay. And I started to walk down through the the tower, and he said, no, go down the outside ladder. And I said, well, why? And no, no, we're just, okay. we're just signaling. Me. Cool. And uh, <laughs> he said, because I want you to. So now I went down the outside ladder, you know, the trifle, the carrier leads over like that, you're 
<laughs> go down that way. Well, I did it anyway, and I got down there. And, oh my God, there was bouncing all around, and uh, I said, if I go over, nobody's even going to know I'm gone. And so I came back, and I he said to me, uh, "You didn't check all those planes." I said, "No, sir, I didn't." I said, "I." I almost fell over a couple of times into the catwalks, and I said, I, you know, I don't have any uh, line on me or anything. And I said, so uh, I don't think that uh, we should be down there. And he said, well, you're going to go down there. And I said, well, sir, uh, I, I don't mean to not to obey orders, but uh, I don't want to go down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, just at that time, the captain walked in. and. Uh, he said, he looked at me, and he said, Oh, incidentally, don't let any of them down on the flight deck. It's too <laughs> rough down there. And I went, oh, oh, oh. Well, this guy, you could see the blood come right up in his face, you know. So he said to me, as a matter of fact, you're off duty. Nobody's going to be down there. Mm -hmm. And he sent me back to my quarters, and, and I think that that was. We lost four planes right off the flight deck. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop you right here because I have to change tapes oh, okay. now. I don't know why they did it, but they would attack us every night. Uh, just about dusk, and they would attack us every morning uh, when the sun was coming up. And uh, you, you could almost set your watch on them. I mean, you know, you'd think they would change their tactics uh, a little bit, but uh, now they would come. And, uh, you know, we were one time at, at Iwo Jima, as I said, we shot so many rockets, we ran out of rockets. And we had to go into what they call an island, Camaretto, and in Camaretto, it was a harbor in there, and there was all these merchant ships in there that, you know, had all kinds of ammunition and God only knows what else on them. But they were all, everybody was trigger happy. Uh, you know, as soon as they saw a plane, they wanted to shoot at it because they thought it was a suicide. And uh, so we came in, we. Everybody had to load ammunition. I don't care what rank you were. You were out there carrying bombs, and and uh, we were putting them, and we hit them all over the deck, you know. And all of a sudden, there was about 50 of them came down and took Camaretto. And I can remember one of them coming around the back, and he came down, and there was an LST right behind us. And he was headed, they all headed for the carriers. And he was headed for us, because we were the only carrier in there. So the old man, he decided uh, to uh, send up some pl uh, fighters. And so he catapulted the four, the four of them. Well, the first one off, uh, followed by Nimit Chapin, and he was from New Hampshire. He just just got off and started to make the turn, and uh, our own merchant ship shot him down. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were so trigger happy, and the second one, we, you know, they, they launched them pretty quick. He was just off the deck. They started shooting at him, and they had broadcast that we were going to launch planes, but somebody didn't get the message. He jumped. The chute opened as he hit the water, and we we didn't know whether he was alive or not. But about a week later, he, he got back on the carrier, so he he did okay. The second one uh, dodged and stayed up there. So then the, uh, the uh, our captain decided we're not staying here. So they pulled up anchor and we left because of uh, these merchant ships. And uh, they tried to get us, but uh, it became dark and uh, mm -hmm. they went out of their way. But one of them, before we left, hit this LST behind us disintegrated. It was gone. And, you know, it was all the bombs he had in there or something. And apparently we hit him with our uh, 
40s mm -hmm. when he was coming in and he saw that he couldn't hit the carrier and he dove into this LST. And uh, it's stuff like that that was terrible. And, uh, I never talked about it. I don't think any of us did for a long, long time. My kids used to say, you never said anything for 20 years. I so said, I didn't want to remember it. Mm -hmm. You know, only the funny things or mm -hmm. something. After the typhoon, where did you go? The, well, also on the typhoon, we lost ships. Uh, the uh, a lot of the uh, destroyers had an awful lot of problems. The cruiser Pittsburgh, after the, when the typhoon was over, and we were on the edge of it. We weren't right in the middle like mm -hmm. the big fleet was. Uh, I flew over the Pittsburgh and lost the whole bow. But there was watertight integrity there, the, mm -hmm. the door. I just I couldn't believe it. See, it was heading back to port. And the bow, it took the whole bow right off of it. And uh, see, it was terrible. Uh, I remember going up to the navigator's cabin. One of my roommates said, let's go up and see what the, the, the pitches on the, on the uh, shipper, and, or the roll. And I said, I don't think I want to see that. <laughs> and we went up anyway, and they have this instrument that goes back and forth, has the red lines, and it was coming right up to the red line. And, and I said to the nephew, he said, well, we hit the red line, and we keep going? He said, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was terrible. And, and they, they lost a lot of planes mm -hmm. off of all the carriers. And, and the big fleet got hit pretty hard. They lost some destroyers and a lot of men. They went dead in the water. After that, uh, we left Okinawa uh, and uh, back. We were out there for those three engagements, the Philippines, which was Lingayen, Luzon, Iwo, and Okinawa. And uh, we went back and turned our planes in at Saipan. I also should tell you, it's just interesting because uh, Roosevelt was president at that time, you know, of, uh, mm -hmm. during the war. Young, FDR Jr., was with us, with, with my carrier. He was one of the, on a DE, uh, command of a DE, and he uh, when we would go off, our carrier would go off for anti-sub, would leave the task force, we were all alone. And we would take uh, four DEs with us off of the, from the screen, from the task force. And he was one of them that was always with us, and he used to fuel from us, and so on and so forth. When FDR died, uh, when we were out there, <laughs> we thought we would all, did he go? To the funeral, and uh, so the only way he could get there would be for one of us and the bombers to take him. But he never went. He never went to his dad's funeral. So when we came in Saipan, and we, uh, I had took in my plane, and uh, they were a bunch of tents and so on and. A lot of people were drinking, and and he was there. And uh, I can remember just uh, talking to him, and I and I was telling him, I said, you know, we thought we were gonna be able to fly you home to your dad's funeral, and and, uh, and he got laughing a little bit, you know. And he said, no. And I said, what? Why didn't you go? He said, you could have gone. And he said, yes, I could have. He said, but I didn't think it was fair. He said that, why should you people, if your father died, you wouldn't have been able to go. And he said it wasn't done in, in disrespect to my dad. And he said it was done in respect for all you other guys. And I thought that was something uh, at that uh, point. Uh, so we turned our planes in and then we headed back to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. And another little point that just comes in here is that one of my roommates, he was a fighter pilot, my name is Brown, good looking guy and a great pilot, and shot down several Jap planes. And uh, 
we were getting ready to go off on a mission this one day, and he, his his wings were full, and we were both on the aft end of the ship, and uh, uh, they let the uh, the fighters go first, and then the bombers took off after. Them. And we were turning into the wind, and all of a sudden a wave hit that carrier, and the carrier just went like that. You know, I'm exaggerating, of course, but. I hit my uh, brake and turned my plane to, like I was going up the hill now and gave it the gun. And of course, my plane we had wider landing gear than, than his did with the, with the FM. His tipped right over, flipped right over. As it did, he put his hands up on the... Can I show you a picture? You know what I'm talking about, the, the cockpit? Yes. Yeah. Here. Well, as it tipped over, the windshield came right down and cut his fingers off. Oh. And, of course, I didn't know that at the time, and uh, the thing came back down again, and all of a sudden they just, come on, come on, you know, I was put on the catapult, and off I went. And we were... Uh, that's another thing on the jeeps. We were pretty much catapulted all the time because we didn't have the, the enough length of the carrier or the wind. The the fastest the ship could go was 17 knots. So if, you know you needed like 25 miles an hour or something to get the heavy loads off of there. What was that catapult like? Was there a lot of g-force? Oh, that was a ride, boy. I'll tell you. After a while, you got used to it. I mean, it did. At first, you couldn't Were they move. steam? Pardon? Steam? No, it was hydraulic. Hydraulics? Today they're all steam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, there was all hydraulic. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, my room was right under the thing, and I can remember that thing going whang, 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 all, all night long or something. But it was a, it was a jolt. And, uh, I mean, you went from zero to 85, 90 knots, just two or three seconds, you know, I mean, and, and you had to have your head back. They made you wear gloves in case you went in, into the ocean because of fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had to have your goggles down and uh, that type of thing. You had to have the, the, uh, the hatch open so you could get out. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of my roommates, he took, took off. In, in, in front of me, and I said the fighters went first on another mission, and boy, he went right in the water, and I saw him. And so now they put me on, and I'm looking down at him, and uh, you didn't know whether he was okay or not, and I, I, I just couldn't see him. Well, as the carrier went by him, one of the, the uh, sailors threw a smoke bomb to indicate where he was to him. Mm -hmm. not thinking that he had a wing tang on and it broke and it was gas on the surface oh. the ignited him the whole gas that's why I couldn't see him all his flame was coming up see and I thought oh my god he's gonna burn alive well we were trained again how to what to do in those cases which you get down underneath the water and swim, trying to get outside the perimeter. And if you have to come up for air, you, you do one of those to keep mm -hmm. the, the water, the gasoline away, grab a quick one and then do it again and so on, which he did. And when I, when I got back on the carrier, I landed and I got out of the plane and I asked the crew chief, I said, how did Logan make out? And, he, and they said, you'll be surprised. I said, what do you mean? He said, uh, he's down in your room. <laughs> and they picked him up and brought him back in the car and he was fine. But uh, that was a, another little story. And a lot of those things uh -huh. happened. And, uh, uh -huh. I can tell you an atheist story if you want to hear an atheist story or don't you want to hear those? Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> this, this one guy, I met him one day going to uh, a church. And uh, they had a, you know, a, a priest who was on our carrier. They had ministers. And, and uh, he said, what are you going to church for? And I said, 
I don't know, I got to have somebody to pray to. I said, I believe in God, so uh, come on with me. No, I'm an atheist, he said. So he said, I like to talk to you sometimes. So why pick me? I don't know anything about atheists or I want to talk to you. So anyway, <coughs> he went on and on, and, and, and he had no faith, so, and all I had was faith, and I didn't know enough about everything about God to be able to speak well to him. But anyway, when we came out of uh, uh, the Straits into the China Sea, and we first came under <coughs> attack, uh, I had a... a an area that I had to go to. I had a job there because I was a bomber pilot my, in case of fire or anything like that. And he was there. And uh, boy, they started, you know, sinking. The carrier next to us got sunk. Another one got hit but didn't sink and so on. And they were reporting this over the loudspeaker. I turn around, this guy's on his knees, <laughs> praying like hell. I didn't say a word, you know, I just went over and I patted him on the head and I said, everything will be all right. But that goes to show you mm -hmm. that even an atheist at times... Uh, can find religion. Yeah. Stuff. So then at Pearl Harbor, as I mentioned, this guy had his fingers cut off. He was, um, oh, at the time, when, and when we came back, they, they had a neurosurgeon, believe it or not, on our carrier. and. He took a wire, made it like a big tennis racket, and he, the fingers were there. So he attached them, again, to the, the guy's hand. And he had a wire coming out of the end to the end of the racket, all, all these fingers coming around. And uh, so, but now he couldn't get a shirt on, so we, it's again amazing what the, the people can do. I went up to the parachute guys and they asked them if they could take a shirt and put some zippers in it so he, and he, they did, and he could get a shirt on and everything. Now was it two hands or just one hand? <coughs> he lost, he lost hand. some on both hands. Ah. But, uh, so, I, I sh they were cut off on both yeah. hands. And uh, they took them off, put them on the hospital ship, and that's the last we saw them. We came into Pearl, who's standing on the dock, but our buddy, and he was there. And you couldn't believe how he lost one finger, that's all. Wow. They all the rest took. Uh, Fifty years later, when we had the reunion, he came to the reunion, and in talking to him, he said that two of them, he, he doesn't have too much feeling in them, but he, he came out fine. This, this doctor was wonderful, you know, that was a long time ago. So after that, then we went back to the States, and uh, we were uh, assigned. I went to LSO school in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And at that time, uh, uh, the war ended. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, on the way back, they had dropped the A-bomb. What were your feelings when you heard about that? Oh, happy as hell. Mm -hmm. I love Harry Truman. <laughs> I wouldn't be here today because we were all scheduled to go back. Mm -hmm. Before we left uh, San Diego to go home, they told us that, uh, you know, if the war keeps going and so on, uh, uh, b before we got in there, that we were had to go back again. And mm -hmm. It would have been terrible. It would have been millions lost. At least that's the way I feel. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know that for sure. Mm -hmm. but I, I thank Harry. Now, when were you discharged? Uh, in '45. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Um, did and you we've had a lot of reunions since, mm -hmm. and uh, of our whole squad, we we got together and we searched for these guys. It wasn't easy, and we found every single one of our squadron. Every one of them. A lot were dead. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about 50 years later yep. now. Uh, a lot were dead, and we were able to get them and bring them to the reunion, and we had a ball in, in talking, you know, because it's very difficult to talk war to someone that doesn't understand it, other than they, you know, they know you're shooting mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I was very fortunate. I was just one of the lucky ones. That's all that got back. And I agree that the ones that are gone, they're the heroes, and I'm not a hero. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, every one of us, there's only a few of us left in our squadron. A lot of them have died. And, uh, it's, you can't believe the bond that's there. Or maybe you can. You can probably. Mm -hmm. from Vietnam. And, uh, it's there. Love it. So, and I thank both of you for letting me do this. Well, it's our I wanted pleasure. To ask you a couple more questions. You uh, obviously used the GI Bill. You said you went back yes. to college. Yes. So. And that was great. Did you ever use that 5220 club? No. I'm trying to remember what. It was a uh, twenty dollars a week for 52 weeks, like an unemployment. No. Oh, no, I don't. <clears throat> okay. Um, did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, I belong to VFW and. Uh, I think that's the only one that, uh, that uh, well, I, of course, uh, when I first came back, I used to go over to Scotia. The Navy had a, a base over there, if you recall, yes. the depot. Yes. And I was able to buy at the, uh, I call it the PX yes. and everything, and, uh, and go to their parties and stuff like that. But then, of course, they moved out and that ended that. I belong there, but mm -hmm. other, other than... Uh, and you did say you went to reunions and you stayed in touch with people that served in your squad and well, there yeah. two guys that served with you. Yeah. Okay. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? It had, uh, I think it made me a much better person. I had more appreciation for people and what they could do and the talents and everything that... Uh, and I also, I had more appreciation for the military of uh, what they did in, in training you and mm -hmm. trying to give you the best so that even in that wartime that you could live. I mean, mm -hmm. the, I hear these things about where, where they're making them ride in trucks and they're not safe. And, and I know that happens. I'm not, but they don't do that deliberately. Mm -hmm. to, uh, and then I... I felt that uh, it made a much better person, and it gave me a lot of leadership too, qualities mm -hmm. of, uh, which I don't think I would have had. Okay. Now you had a photograph of yourself in, in, uh, in the yeah. cockpit. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You just hold that up. Uh, this was taken on on the carrier, <coughs> the uh, CVE. I'm getting a little bit of glare. If you can just tilt that. Oh, that's perfect right yeah. there. And uh, this is, uh, I came down one day and after landing and going forward and one of my roommates just came up and took this picture. And, uh, uh, I was uh, a lot thinner. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, our first reunion <laughs> when my gunner saw me, I, you know, I was very thin at the fly when he, last time he saw me. And, he just took one look at me and he said, you got to be kidding me, <laughs> because he hadn't put on any weight at all. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hold up your uh, pilot's license there? We've never seen one of those from, you got from the Navy. Yep. This is my instrument rating and, and my pilot saying I'm a naval aviator. Is that all right? Hold it right there for a second. You want it closer? I'm just getting a little he, glare. He just, can, just, can. just tilt it, because I, I've got a zoom lens. Just he tilt it a little bit. Lens. Oh, that's good right there. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, you guys much. for what you do. I think it's. It's great that uh, they have a history of some of this.